thanks so much uh, to organizers, particularly to Thomas Poggi for, for, for having me here on behalf of um, Diego Sanchez and Cochea based at the University of Oxford and myself. Uh, this is a presentation about social policy, about putting universalism and universal social policy to the service of global justice. And it speaks nicely, I think, to some of the debates we, we opened this morning when we were talking about global health. Um, let me start by saying that in two, 2009, um, the Salvadorian um, election gave the left, the left uh, party, uh, access to power for the very first time in history. Um, their social agenda was ambitious and obstacles to honor it were immense. Uh, High-ranking officials at that time invited a team of uh, policy experts to discuss the best strategy to reform social policy nationwide. The winning president told us uh, that he would keep and expand conditional cash transfers programs that had been launched in 2005, but, but letting the urban middle class know that social policy could be meaningful to them as well, President Funes committed to the idea that the non-poor are often one illness away from becoming poor, as um, Arinod uh, Krishni, uh, Krishni's books tell us, right? So uh, President Funes thought that um, in line with international debates in Latin America at this moment, that universal social policy can be seen and has to be seen as a door, as a path, as the alternative to the preceding narrow anti-poverty programs. Uh, of course, this, far from solving the problem, creates many dilemmas, right? Um, could middle-income families be reached in the face of very limited resources in a country that devoted $200 per year per person to the entire social policy system, right? And that was coming from a bloody civil war uh, which was over land and opportunities, which, by the way, uh, ended without much redistribution, neither of land nor of opportunities. How could pressing short-term demands, short-term impacts, short-term solutions be met while also considering long-term objectives of bringing everybody, everybody under a unifying set of services? And how can this be done in a context of very powerful stakeholders interest groups running private schools, pharmacies, and medical facilities. So the Salvadorian conundrum to which I was a direct witness took place in a global context of growing attention to universalism. And the post-MDG debate uh, placed universalism uh, in, in that global agenda, right? In this debate, however, um, Universalism is usually understood as entailing a broad coverage uh, of essential services. That means that these are services which the non-poor take for granted, all of us take for granted, right? While, um, while, while become very, very relevant uh, for the poor alone. So this take on universalism makes the focus on services that must be available for the poor decoupled from considerations about services available for the non-poor and decoupled from quality and equity for society as a whole, including, of course, the poor. Something very similar occurs with the WHO's um, assessment of successful stories in healthcare systems nowadays in countries like Burundi, Cambodia, Chile, Ghana, and Rwanda. So this take on universalism makes the focus on services, um, uh, it, it places the, the question of whether universalism can be restricted to massive coverage without regard for generosity and for quality. Doesn't this mean that the poor are then, under this notion, confined to certain facilities apart from the non-poor for them to access a given set of essential services which, are, which also sets them apart from the non-poor? So can this strategy really contribute to income distribution and global justice? And that's like a, a key question, right? The ongoing uh, global debate on social rights seems to us gives uh, us a valuable opportunity to agree on a more ambitious 
definition of what universalism is, one that can borrow from the experience of social democratic countries in the North, but that at the same time is feasible and credible for the specific economic and political conditions of the developing world. So under the social democratic definition of universalism, following authors like Corpy and Sping Anderson and Huber, um, universalism refers to a situation in which everyone receives some entitlements that are generous enough to ensure people's well-being well -being, as understood in a given context without resorting to the market, right? So we think that this is a definition that, um, uh, that moves us apart from this uh, two-tier system, one for the poor and another for the non-poor, um, for the non-poor for the time being, I should say, to um, a strategy that, that can really put universalism to the service of income distribution and global, um, um, and global justice. Uh, in short, to be truly meaningful, universalism is not just about access and coverage, but also about sufficiency and quality uh, with equity across income groups. But of course, uh, this, is, uh, this, this, this way of understanding universalism can uh, play uh, an important role in the post-MDGs um, uh, and, 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 in, and in, the, in the current global um, in the current global debate. Um, now, calling for similar high-quality services for all sounds like a great idea, uh, but I'm sure you are uh, you are thinking, is this really feasible? I mean, I mean, are we talking about something that can be really done? Uh, so the most recent response to this is the notion of basic social protection, um, the basic social protection floor promoted by the UN. Um, under this notion, everybody should have access as a matter of right to some essential services and transfers that improve uh, the, their well-being and expand solidarity across uh, all groups in society. So the driving idea is that governments must start from some minimum entitlements that governments ensure to all and gradually create the political capital uh, and the resources, the fiscal resources, to increase uh, this floor, this, this basic floor. By highlighting the role of public policy in ensuring social rights and by moving away from previous social programs that acted only under emergency situations, right? Um, the basic social protection floor brings very good news for global social justice. At the same time, by highlighting that countries must start by uh, assuring only essential transfers and services first, and in the presence of growing marketization of social services, including of course private health and pension plans, the basic floor is bound or has the risk of feeding a two-tiered two system of very basic public services for most and a world of opportunities for the very few who can rely on, markets, uh, on market access. So this will, uh, may well end up harming the quality of public basic services, which will not benefit from the loud, or at least louder, voice of the middle class. So um, policy decisions today regarding how to create a basic floor and how to expand that basic floor will create a path dependency that can be in the direction of a unifying uh, guarantee of social rights for all or can be in the direction of a two-tiered system, one for the poor and another one for the non-poor. Um, so, um, we think that universalism understood that just the basic social protection floor may waste a valuable opportunity to build potential alliances between the poor and the non-poor, which, which is a somewhat artificial distinction when it comes to risks such as healthcare, because we all know that it's, you know, with one catastrophic event, a migrant who's been saving for 20 years in New York and sending money by, back home to San Salvador, let's say, uh, falls under the poverty line because his or her mother is in the hospital for one week. One week, and, and, that's, and that's enough for a very um, uh, serious downward mobility, right? 
So now, what does it take to build a universal social policy in peripheral countries, whether low-income or even middle-income countries? Is it, is it possible? Um, where do we start if it's not only from the, from the, from the uh, social protection floor, from a basic social protection floor? Of course, there is a cautionary, cautionary note here, and, uni and that is that universal policies, as we define them, have never been built overnight. They involve long-term policy processes capable of enacting the appropriate policy architectures so that past dependency fits, fits into successive incorporation of people with different backgrounds. Now, since the 1940s, the building of universalism in the UK, in the Scandinavian countries, in Costa Rica, in the, in the, in the global south, has had to deal with uh, anti-universalistic forces, and we need to understand them well to deal with them. One is segmentation, and the other is marketization. So segmentation refers to the provision of social services that uh, vary across um, in access and generosity across social groups. And historically, the main source of segmentation in social policy was social insurance, which gave people access and generosity along occupational lines. Whether you were military or a teacher, you would have a different fate in life, right? Uh, more, most recently, conditional cash transfers have been a primary source of segmentation in the sense that they enforce school attendance and they help medical checkups. They, they reach out for 100 million uh, people in Latin America at the moment, uh, which is very positive, of course, but at the same time, they haven't contributed much to reduce the social distance between them and the non-poor. Marketization, on the other hand, refers to pressures for expanding private provision of transfers and services. And in Latin America, we know that, I mean, because we, we come out of a wave of pro-market reforms that pushed millions of people out of state-funded social services into a commodified, highly precarious access to services because there are economic cycles, right? And of course, um, that puts people uh, and middle class people as well, in a very vulnerable situation because they depend on highly uneven um, um, economic cycles and expensive out-of-pocket and prepaid fees. So um, in gradually building a universal system that avoids these two dan dangers, right, segmentation and marketization, um, and, and, and therefore fuels universalism, countries need to choose the right policy architectures capable of building cross-class solidarity. And so if we manage to tame uh, illicit global capital, we would need to be quite clear about what's the, the kind of policy architecture that can make good use of those additional resources, right? So this is a discussion that we need to have, you know, uh, uh, simultaneously to how we fund these uh, policy architectures. Uh, we need an appropriate layout of policy instruments that ensure who access to what and when in ways that incrementally but increasingly mixes people in the most unequal region of the world with Gini coefficients of, of 0.64 as the case of Guatemala. This is, of course, not an easy uh, conversation. Um, this is easier to be done with transfers, and the best case we have in Latin America is the Bolivian creation of non-contributory pensions in 2008. President Evo Morales created this system, um, the Renta Dignidad, out of, uh, out of direct taxes on natural resources. Now, in most cases, and particularly when it comes to services, um, universalism takes time and requires the gradual building of alliances. And research shows that uh, this uh, policy architecture needs to solve four, four main things. So the countries that have succeeded have, have successfully dealt with these four features. First, they've been able to incorporate from the very beginning lower income groups, not only the very poor, but lower income groups. Um, and this is what um, my colleague Diego Sanchez and Coche and I referred as to uh, building from the bottom up, from the bottom up of the social structure. Secondly, uh, they have incentives, these systems have managed to create incentives that increasingly engage people, meaning that those that got in 
cannot shut the door and leave the rest out, as it happened in the southern corn in Uruguay, Chile, um, and Argentina uh, during the 20th century. Third, um, these systems draw on targeted policies as instruments for affirmative action, right? So they facilitate the access of the very poor to social programs that the lower and upper middle class are using through affirmative action within these unified systems. And finally, they are, and this is very, of course, difficult, they are capable of managing and limiting the private sector, um, the, the role of the private sector, including uh, the medical professionals. So um, the role that comes out of these four aspects is one that ca can, can, can cope with the trade-offs between how many people are reached on the one hand and with how attractive services on the other hand as compared to market services based on generosity and costs. Um, and so it is designing policy architectures capable of dealing with the tensions between horizontal and vertical um, expansion that cross-class uh, class, uh, cross -class solidarity and therefore universalism can be built. Costa Rica provides a very good illustration of the gradually yet steady building of universal social policy. In 1940, most school children in Costa Rica were barefoot, and the country had a higher income mortality, uh, infant mortality, than Mexico, El Salvador, and Ecuador. This was 1940. By 1960, the country, Costa Rica, was already, uh, already had the lowest infant mortality of, the, of, mortality of these four countries. Uh, so, um, Costa Rica in 1940 really did not seem the most adequate place to build a health and pension system with high quality for everybody, and yet in the following 40 years, uh, it did exactly that. It built a social policy that expanded uh, among the low and low middle income workers, not the very poor alone, but the very poor also, to which the poor and the upper middle class were incorporated. So this way, universalism become an indispensable instrument to promote human development and social justice. Of course, you may think this could be done in 1940, but it's not possible nowadays, because now, nowadays we have a stronger private sector and a weaker state, and weaker state capacities, um, and, and therefore it's not possible. Now, in the case of, of El Salvador, going back to the beginning, as I wrap up my argument, um, in El Salvador, during the past four years, in terms of healthcare services, the government has taken important steps to expand primary care among the rural poor, those who had always been excluded from the very, the most basic social services. But what's been most decisive for universalism is not that measure itself, but the elimination of out-of-pocket payments in public services, uh, which in one year increased access to half a million people um, in terms of uh, access to hospital facilities, and secondly, an ambitious regulation of the market of overpriced medical prescriptions. And just to give you an example, um, the same one prescription that cost $14 in Ecuador nowadays before this law was passed, in El Salvador, cost uh, was $40, like the same brand, the same prescription. So both of these measures, the elimination of co-payments and the regulation of market prices for drugs, um, being extremely, extremely helpful for the poor, have reached the non-poor as well, and are starting to create a potentially powerful alliance between the poor and, and the non-poor. Um, so there is a great opportunity to rethink equity-enhancing policy architectures, and we see uh, in different parts of the world different attempts to doing that. Um, the recent uh, accent on, on, on universalism, even if defined as involving broad coverage of very basic, very basic transfers and services, opens a great opportunity for rethinking equity-enhancing social policy. Um, we now need to go well beyond coverage of the very basic to think about the policy architectures that can mix people, poor and non-poor. In terms of healthcare, it may involve expanding services where all groups have a stake, say surgeries, while also regulating prices of critical inputs, say medicines. Of course, um, the building of universalism will not take just one measure. It's not going to be um, 
one-shot measure, but uh, will be built gradually and over the long term. And precisely because governments uh, struggle with short electoral cycles, international agreements that that, that frame our understanding of what universalism is and what universalism can do for the poor population uh, will be very, very important to build longer term um, um, strategies. Thank you. Thank you.